Hello, everybody. I certainly wish I were there with you uh, in to CHLA, but I can't be uh, because I live in an immunocompromised household where traveling is still dangerous. So I'm taking advantage of CHLA's kind offer to international participants to present a video instead. And I'm going to sign myself off here and share my screen with you for the rest of this talk. Many of you know that I have always been interested in the processes of reading, uh, particularly in childhood. And uh, I set up a project to explore the implications of place on reading experience. And somewhat to my surprise, I wound up with a considerable amount of discussion of the role of trees and forest uh, in the reading experience reading experiences, I should say, since it's absolutely plural. So let's have a look at some of what my participants had to say. Reading does present a kind of alchemy. Um, readers bring to that process um, their experience of a place in the world, the raw materials that they develop. They transform these raw materials to help them build a fictional world that may be visual or audio or just uh, more kinesthetic. We know that readers um, process their reading experiences in different ways. And what I want to do today is give a very, very swift overview of a few sample accounts of some of the ways that readers talked about trees in their real life city experience and literary forests that they developed to read into. My project involved 12 undergraduate readers aged 18 to 25, and each of them made a digital map of a landscape that was important to their literate youth. And we had two interviews about this map, uh, one when they were partway through it and the second when they were finished. Now my research uh, assistants and I posted of calls for participation all across the campus of my large Western Canadian University. And we got readers from many different countries and many disciplines, even though the total group was quite small. Out of the 12 uh, participants, we got people with experience living in Canada, China, India, Iraq, Pakistan, and Somalia. And we got students from education, engineering, environmental sciences, fine arts with a major in painting, food and nutrition, industrial design, and psychology. So quite a range. Uh, and it was interesting that their diversity as individual readers was every bit as great as these more external indicators of diversity. So let's start with Matt, who presents us with what many of us might consider a conventional model of reading experience. And I should say that this image and all the other images in this presentation come from the maps that the participants produced. Matt played amongst the trees behind his school soccer pitch. He said, I spent a lot of my time in there building forts. And when he talked about reading, he said it was a lot easier to imagine yourself being in these stories and reenacting these stories when you have an environment like that around you. So this for me is a very strong narrative where I can take things from my childhood and visions from my childhood and imprint them on the literature I was reading. And when we think about uh, children making use of their life experiences as re in their reading. It's Matt's story that we frequently uh, consider to be the, the sort of base level version. Ying Yu uh, talks about reading in a somewhat different way. Uh, she presented these four generic images of forests and some of her reading is generic too. When she begins to read, she doesn't invest very much in sorting out a detailed background. She says, I don't imagine too much on just one image, but a flash of images, because this way I will be less confused as to how the story can go. If sudden changes happen, it is easier to accept. And Renata Brosh in particular uh, provides a theoretical background that describes exactly the sort of reading that Ying Yu uh, explains here. When Ying Yu adds detail as required, she frequently read books about fairies and nymphs 
who hung out in forests. And so she would incorporate more specific memories of the forest with fallen logs, lots of tall trees, bushes and small trees. And importantly, she says, uh, it's more close up, it's detailed and it's less vague because it gives off a stronger nature feel. And the feeling was as important as the visuals. Rhea supplies trees as a necessity for plot development. Uh, they provide an adventurous kind of atmosphere. Rhea grew up uh, in a walled garden in the Indian tea valleys. And on her map, you can see here, she supplied a row of trees between the wall and the garden. And um, Rhea likes to read accurately. I pay attention to everything uh, that I read. Uh, so I asked her what might be called the Ying Yu question. If you set it up and it's wrong, can you change it? And she said, no, it's not hard to change it. It's obvious and glaring. It hits me in the face if it's wrong. It's easy to change it. Uh, and so if it doesn't seem right, I would go back and read and see if I did something wrong or if I made a wrong assumption and then fix it. But her memories were not quite as accurate. She and I were both childhood readers of The Famous Five by Enid Blyton. Um, she in India, me in the east coast of Canada, so half a world apart and half a century apart as well. There's about 50 years between our reading experiences of Enid Blyton. But our conversation uh, was largely a source of great agreement about the kinds of conditions that would allow adventures of the nature of the Famous Fives to take place. She wanted to have trees as an essential component of this adventure story, I called for running water. But in fact, when I went back and looked at Enid Blyton um, and the famous five, Kieran Island is specified by her as not only treeless, but also explicitly with no fresh water. So we were remembering much more generically of default requirement of trees um, and streams as part of the story. Amani brought her fiction back to the landscape. Uh, her map included um, a generic civic park, and she talked about many civic parks in her childhood, all in the Western Canadian city where this um, project took place. She uh, lived in many different houses uh, and played in many different parks. So she made a kind of a collective park for her image. There was one set of woods that she was frightened of um, because there were a lot of stories around them. One book I read, I believe it was Goosebumps, where they did go into the woods in the scenario. And I did definitely think of these woods because I had heard like horror stories around it. And so she supplied these woods straight into her story, not only for the visuals, but for the atmosphere. So I asked her, so it's not just woodness in your head, it, it's scary woodness. And she laughed and said, it's like classic slasher woodness, I guess. Um, but at her second interview, came, she came back still laughing, uh, talking about the scary forest and said she'd looked at Google Earth. And it turns out that her scary forest was really just a few trees behind the park. Uh, she had imagined it as a huge forest, but really it was just a small collection of trees. And that extrapolation of a small number of trees into something more substantial, more stately, more atmospheric as required by the story was something that many readers talked about doing. The most specific and explicit description of this process came from Halia. Um, Halia learned to make do in very many ways with her small repertoire of real trees um, and her need for something more um, exciting in her stories. Halia was an Iraqi Canadian. She immigrated at the age of six and she read in both Arabic and English. She read her Arabic books in the family living room because her parents were anxious to see that she kept up her Arabic reading. And if she read in Arabic, she automatically inserted Iraqi backgrounds as mental settings for her reading. And in her childhood, her Iraqi backgrounds were more detailed. Um, uh, she read her English stories in her bedroom. 
Uh, to read in English, she drew on a much more shallow stock of Canadian imagery. Her parents, as new Canadians, were nervous about her going very far afield. Uh, she didn't even go into the little stand of trees behind her house. So in her reading, she had to extrapolate from a very small repertoire indeed, and this was difficult to do, and it gave her the potential to be quite explicit about the challenges of the process. The little stand of trees stood behind her house across the other side from the parking lot. And she didn't go out into these trees, but she did admire them. And she drew on them to furnish her reading. There was a tiny amount of woods there and that was basically it. I didn't see much besides that. I saw the Rocky Mountains once and that really stuck with me. And so Halia used this small repertoire to furnish uh, quite a substantial amount of Canadian reading. And she expanded these trees into whatever kind of literary forest would be needed for her reading. She says the forest would be 20 more trees than the one outside my house and pine trees and things like that. We didn't have that in Iraq. We had palm trees. So pine trees were very interesting at the time for me. But sometimes that mental forest was pretty makeshift and she talks about the limits of her imagining also quite explicitly. For example, she talked about one book called The Raven's Quest by Sharon Stewart, which was very descriptive in the way it described the Canadian landscape. And so she created a mixture of the Rocky Mountains that she saw very briefly and what was outside her house. But she also found herself mixing things up. She, uh, she says, I was reading a lot of rural stories about forests and things like that, but I would mix that up. I would mix up urban with rural. Like I'd assume they'd be like, oh, okay, there's a stream and the raven was drinking from the stream. And I'd imagine a street right beside the stream. And she was clear later on that that was a city street she was placing beside her stream. And so what she was producing was just about good enough to keep her going but it was by no means the full-blooded transfer that Matt was able to achieve so effortlessly. In this tiny sample, we can see even in this very swift overview that there are differences and these differences do matter. Um, what we saw just in this super brief account uh, was readers importing life experiences in any small wood as fully as possible into their reading imagery or processing temporary flashes and not slowing down to flesh them out until details are explicitly required or reading carefully but remembering generically or looking at the lives in their the trees in their own lives through the filter of fiction or making do with schematic settings and overriding any discrepancies in the cause of keeping going. Or there are many, many other ways that readers behave uh, when they come to the transfer of real life experience to uh, their fictional requirements. These readers all voluntarily raise the topic of woods and trees and how they develop a literary forest setting out of life experience of city trees. I didn't ask any questions about uh, woods or trees or forests. Uh, this all was spontaneously raised by the readers. Um, and the eight readers who talked about it clearly see trees as a distinctive feature of urban life. And I think Ying Yu summed up what many of them would think. It feels like an adventure just walking beneath the trees in a city. Trees are alive, trees are wild, trees are not a built environment. Um, and so trees exist in the city as a space of potential and a kind of liminal transfer point into fictional imagining of stories set elsewhere. Uh, sometimes good enough is all that's required. Ying Yu didn't seem to want anything more until she did. Sometimes it's all that's possible. So Halia may do with what she was able to drum up as uh, a forest experience. Readers behave differently, even though their urban trees were clearly pretty similar, even when they talked about identical texts. Uh, many of them discussed Harry Potter, for example, where forests are clearly very important. Uh, and there were significant points of agreement in the way that they talked about it, but their minds produce these transfers in different ways. 
and Matt's one-for-one -one transfer of a forest setting is only one possibility out of a wide range of, of reader repertoires and reader behaviors. And we need to think about how we can best make room theoretically and in our classrooms for such profound variety. So once over lightly, there is more. Before I leave, I would like to acknowledge gratefully the support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for this project and express my huge and enormous gratitude to the 12 participants in this project and to everyone who worked on it over a number of years. And just put in a, a little note that if you this subject intrigues you, there's more coming this summer when my book on this project arrives from Bloomsbury Academic. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Have a great conference, everybody, and I hope I can see you next year. <laughs>